Good day, I'm Martin Gago with Market Radius Research. It's Tuesday, February the 8th. We've got CEO Mike Walkinshaw of Tamaya Capital. Tamaya has a loan origination platform to fund private market high yield loan opportunities through revenue-based investments and asset-backed loans on behalf of LPs, institutions, retail investors, uh, I've known Mike for several years and I've always been impressed with his determination. And while lending isn't the sexiest and most exciting business, especially if you're doing it correctly, it can have an excellent risk reward profile and be good means of value creation. I'm thinking that during hot markets, like over the past couple of years with cheap equity and capital, revenue and asset lending probably wasn't the easiest of things, but during high volatility times and when risk capital is fleeing, this could create good opportunities and higher margins for Tamaya. Given Tamaya's strong performance over the last few years and its recent acquisitions, stars could really be aligning. Please remember, this is neither a recommendation nor investment advice. We're here to learn about the company, do your due diligence, and come to your own investment conclusions. Mike, thanks a lot for joining us today, and tell us about Tamaya. Thanks, Martin. Uh, very much appreciate the opportunity today, and, and great to talk to everybody. I, uh, thanks to everybody for hopping on the webinar. Tamaya Capital has been around... Uh, for about six years. Um, Martin, you and I have, have met a number of times over the years, uh, and we have really started to scale and grow this business. Um, what does Tamaya Capital do? We are revolutionizing the private credit industry, and we think it's an industry that is well and long overdue for innovation. And we are able to use technology to create extra value and then to share that extra value with common shareholders. And so very specifically, we, you get the question a lot, how exactly are you doing that within the private credit industry? Well, we've built over the last six, six years a technology platform. It's deep um, in the sector. And with that technology platform, we're able to deliver superior investment returns, both through higher quality deals, as well as earning higher returns on those investments than other similar investors in our space. We deliver those deals using more efficient operations, less humans involved in the operation, and that provides us with lower operating costs and uh, operating in spaces where others cannot. And specifically, that means we're able to do smaller deals that others can't do efficiently, and thus we're able to earn some higher returns in those sectors. And then finally, after all of that, we're able to deliver transparency to yield investors who want to see what their investments are. And I, for a number of your investors who are following the space, they may be aware of some of the um, opaqueness that the private credit industry has been famous for over the last bunch of years, and some of the bad uh, situations that have occurred with other private credit companies, we are able to provide using our technology transparency to those investors so they feel more comfortable investing with us. They're able to provide us the yield capital, which I will note the common shareholders are not providing. And that allows us to, to dig into those deals, provide them with the transparency and provide the capital at a much at a more reasonable cost than others. Now, Important to note that Tamaya Capital as a public company is actually two different operating entities um, under the surface. One is Tamaya Capital, the technology lender, which provides finance to recurring revenue software companies. And the other is Pivot Financial, uh, which I'll talk about. It's an acquisition we just completed in September of 2021. And it provides capital to small and medium businesses, primarily in Ontario. Both of these companies are backed by the technology platform that we have built over the last six years. So let's talk a little bit more specifically about what goes on underneath the surface and the value of the platform. So what you see here is pretty much what any private credit organization would do. They originate loans. They then determine if those loans are good or bad by underwriting them and using credit scoring systems. They then decide which of those loans they want to invest in and they create a portfolio of loans and then they service those loans once those loans are in place and once the capital is extended. Um, and then of course, finally, they have to provide the capital for the portfolio in the first place. 
So those are the four basic components of what any organization does. In each of these four components, we use technology to improve the operations in every one of these spots. And I will now, let me step through and show you a little bit more detail as to how we provide that detailed, um, the techno technological underpinning of every one of these areas. So under the standard model, the old model and some of what our competitors would, would do when they're originating, they just wait for accountants and lawyers and, and other investors in the network or trade shows and that's how they originate deals. It's costly, it's slow, it takes a lot of time. And, and sorry, Mike, this is kind of obvious, but origination is sort of you're finding leads, you're finding prospects to say, hey, you guys could need money or do need money, and let's start a conversation. That's essentially what origination is. That's exactly what origination is. So it's somebody who reaches out and says, I'd like a loan. Yeah. And then, so finding as many of those origination leads as possible is very, very important in this business because you'd like to select from a large pool so that you get the best deals. That's what you want. So we have utilized um, many of the tools that were created in the software space in terms of marketing to be able to go out and generate as large a pool of origination leads as we possibly could. And that's very specifically using online uh, targeted ads, both through LinkedIn, through Google, and through other marketing platforms online to get our ads in front of as many eyeballs, very specific targeted eyeballs as possible. We then data track, um, we create interesting and compelling content that supports the message. And all of that drives uh, origination of leads all the way across North America in a much cheaper manner than all of our competitors. So we're able to seek deals in Florida, in the East Coast, in Atlanta. We seek deals in California. We seek deals in Denver, Salt Lake City, all of these places across North America. We're able to get in there and find deals in ways that our competitors cannot find these deals. The second major bucket is underwriting. So Mike. Yep. Sorry, I had myself on uh, mute there for a sec. So uh, from looking at the Tamaya model versus the standard model, uh, is it fair to infer that you don't have a referral network, you don't work with paid agents and you don't do trade shows or is that part of your sort of origination mix as well, except you lean maybe more heavily on the, the digital marketing side of it? Referral is a part of our mix, but a very small part of our mix. So approximately say 10% of our overall leads. So we, we do have some referral networks in place, uh, but there are other organizations where referral is 100% of their lead gen. Well, for us, it's about 10% of the total. And I'm guessing running, uh, of course, how many Google ads or LinkedIn ads you run is essentially cheaper than paying um, referral fees and agents and, and so forth, because they're looking for a cut of the size of the loan where Google or LinkedIn doesn't have that kind of access anymore. They just get a pay per click or something. Yeah, I mean, referral agents can be looking for as much as one to one and a half percent of the value of the loan. So if you think about that, that's, that's a very large portion of what would be considered the margin, the gross margin of any loan. So referral networks are very expensive. Um, and yeah, I mean, you're paying for ads, but it is much cheaper to run these uh, programs through uh, online advertising than it is to pay referrals for these deals. There's a second element to that though, Martin, that's really important. One is, which is um, the volume of deals you see is much higher. And so you're able to select from a much larger pool of deals and thus you're picking better deals. So that's really also a very important. You're not only uh, driving down the cost of origination, you're actually improving the quality of origination at the same time. And okay. I'm guessing if you're getting a bigger amount of bigger deal flow, and then I guess this is where we're going to get to your underwriting stuff, you need more processes to automate that system so you not have a warehouse full of people uh, on calculators figuring out ratios and so forth. Yeah, and there was some... <clears throat> So, so one of the things that's embedded in our business is the ability to provide a loan to a company that normally could not get a loan. And one of the reasons for that is there's sort of a minimum loan size that made sense for most 
standard organizations, most you know, private credit organizations. And that loan size might be, say, $3 million. So in other words, we're not going to do a loan that's less than $3 million because it's just not worth the work. And we, because of we're automated, are able to go in and offer loans for $500,000 to companies in ways at, at rates that are really quite attractive for the investors. And, um, uh, and that's really because we've automated um, the large majority of our processes. And so we're able to do these loans cheaper and get into spots where other, where our competitors really can't get into. So that's one of the reasons we're able to make a higher return you know, and find and find a lot, you know, a, a broader breadth of uh, deals across North America. Well, I'm guessing if you're you can target people or corporations who can't normally get loans, you may even like part of your at like I guess you said you write content and and so forth, trying to educate people. Hey, like everyone else has turned you down, but we've got opportunities for small loans and and so forth. So so convincing people who didn't think they had a loan facility option to kind of convince them that they do or, or yeah. let them know that they do? Yeah, that's a big part of our business is educating. Uh, I'll give you a case study, for example. Entrepreneur has uh, $1.752 million of revenue per year. Um, they might think their only option is to go and try and find either angel capital or venture, venture capital on the private side. Um, for us, that's a very attractive company if a bunch of other metrics on that company are met. Um, so getting content in front of that person saying, hey, here's another option and here's how this option could work out for you. And here's why it's better than doing angel capital or venture capital. And you know that company might be a great company for us and it might not even work for venture capital, but you do have to get in front of them and convince them that that is a viable option for them because they will spend a bunch of time spinning their wheels trying to get venture capital and eventually not succeeding. So we will um, do a lot on um, helping the entrepreneur understand what their options are, knowing that this is an option for them. And I, I guess what you're also implying through all this, the at least on the revenue-based SaaS side of the business, these are all sort of young, growing companies, um, like sort of th that maybe have venture capital options. These are not like old uh, bumper manufacturers or, or, or whatever that you're talking to. Yeah, so two sides of the business. On the Tamaya Capital side, it's all software uh, tech companies, it might be an internet of things companies, for example. It might be a tech-enabled so uh, service provider company. There's a bunch of different aspects of it, but they're all tech. They all have gross margins that are generally very high. So in other words, 60, 70, 80% gross margins. They're all growing, um, but they and they're all losing money, generally speaking, when we engage with them. So they might have some monthly losses on the order of 50, 100, 150,000 bucks a month, but they're investing in growth. And that scorecarding system that we built targets those companies and pulls them up to the top. Those are the ones we want. On the pivot side of the business, it's a bit of a different, it's a bit of a different model. They're definitely looking for um, manufacturing companies, retailers, uh, some cannabis companies, some ISPs, other sorts of companies that uh, in a similar vein are not able to get normal financing, but have something appealing about them that um, you know, we think we think is worth worth the bet. So there's kind of two different markets, but yeah, tech, the Tamaya side is definitely focused on tech companies. Great. So the underwriting part, um, very important that once you've generated all these leads, you now are sorting through those leads in an automated fashion using scorecarding that you've created yourself and it's tuned very specifically to each industry. So now you're moving through and, and separating the wheat from the chaff and um, decide and funding the best companies. You, you move into, now you've funded this company, you are now servicing it. We have an automated system of pulling data from our portfolio on a monthly basis and um, delivering that information up into our system and evaluating those companies in an automated fashion, identifying any problems early, looking for companies that are tracking in the wrong direction, and that allows us as a management team to engage with those companies earlier than most of our competitors 
um, and help sort out problems along the way. Um, and then helping eventually helping those companies achieve an exit, which gets us paid out. And that is, um, you know, we've done 60 loans over the last six years uh, on the Tamaya Capital side. You know, north of 30 of those have been bought out, paid out fully. Um, we've had uh, near zero uh, default problems in the portfolio. Um, it has really truly been an amazing system in terms of the returns it's been able to deliver over that period. And then finally, I, sorry, Martin, were you going to ask a question? Yeah, you, you said you've done 60 over the last six years, 10 a year, I, I guess, on average. I presume it's it was fewer at the beginning and it, things are ramping up now. Maybe over the six year average, it uh, doesn't make sense. But over the last couple of years, for every loan that you do underwrite, how many have you looked at? Like what, what's your, sort of your hit rate, so to speak? Yeah, 10 to one, at least okay. 10 to one, maybe maybe 15 to one for sure. And I guess that filters through, you get 10, the first five you look at, oh wait, this is, we can just look at the basic application, say this doesn't work. And then as you've titrated down, you, 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 you get the better and better hit rate. So you don't put all that effort into all of them, you sort of triage them, so to speak? Yeah, we, we have a three-stage process. So stage one is a very quick evaluation of some very high-level metrics. It's an automated process. Data comes in, quick evaluation, um, and we determine whether that's a company we're interested in, in or not. We, you know, we tell, immediately tell the entrepreneur, no or yes, we're interested. That is useful for them. It's useful for us knock a bunch of companies off the table that aren't going to meet our, our qualifications. We then move into a second layer where we do more detailed work. Again, automated data flows up into our system, and now we're evaluating in a much deeper way the underlying company. It's based upon that data that we decide whether to issue a term sheet or not. We then negotiate a term sheet, assuming the term sheet gets negotiated and, and agreed to. We then move into our third phase, which is where we really pull the company apart and start to look at it. And as you can imagine, the first phase, obviously, everybody coming in the pipe. There's a lot of companies knocked off the table. Second phase, um, about 50% of the companies get knocked off the table. And then when we get to the last phase, um, about eight out of 10 complete when we get into due diligence. But we do knock a few off the table in that due diligence phase once we start to really see under the covers as to what's going on in the company. Well, how long does that whole process when someone contacts you to actually underwriting it, how, how long is that process typically? So that first phase uh, is less than an hour. So it's very quick data upload, 10 questions, done. Second phase uh, can be as short as uh, three days or two days to as long as two weeks. And we can have, we generally have a term sheet in front of somebody uh, within a week to two weeks of first engagement. Um, once that term sheet, the negotiation of the term sheet can take quite a while in terms of making sure, you know, both side, both parties are comfortable with all the terms. Once that is signed, uh, we then move into that due diligence phase, which is typically two to three weeks. So from first engagement to money in the bank can be as short as say three weeks to as long as six weeks. Seems to be good. Um, yeah, not it, painful it, process for the uh, the entrepreneur trying to fund their business. They get quick feedback and they can either take the plan or move on. Yeah, you know, despite the fact that we don't fund a lot of the companies that we engage with, um, I would say that the entrepreneurs are generally happy with the process, especially when it's held up in comparison to angel investing or venture capital investing, where you know it's endless cycles of due diligence and long-term, you know, long-term um, uh, building of information pools, which uh, is a waste of a lot of the time of the entrepreneur along the way who has a better, you know, better, whose time is better spent building their business, really. Do you get any referrals from the VCs uh, or do they sort of, they view you as a, a threat or a competitor or you're kind of grabbing some of the security so that they don't like that or... That's a very complicated question. It's a very interesting question. Um, we will get referrals from VCs for companies in their portfolio that uh, where maybe the company has underperformed what the venture capital model needs it to do. Remember, those companies, you know, a VC model is looking for, can I take this company public on the NASDAQ? And to the extent that a company proves itself to not be a NASDAQ IPO capable company, 
uh, three, four years down the line, we will see those companies come to us and look for financing. And that that does not mean in any way that they're not great loans for us to do. Um, but but often that's when we'll see the venture capital companies engaging with us in their portfolio companies. Um, sometimes we also see um, companies being referred to us from venture capital players who are waiting for the company to grow another million dollars in revenue or another $2 million in revenue before they get engaged. And they do see us as a nice way to um, you know, help these companies grow through up to that stage where they can now become invested. So there is that. No doubt, though, that if a company is a $1 million revenue company and it's growing at 100% per annum, there is a lot of competition with VCs for that particular kind of deal on our, on our books. Yeah, it's a very complex relationship between debt and uh, venture capital. So finally, let's just talk a little bit about the funding aspect. So, you know, we uh, do not use common share equity to fund loans. We use common share equity to invest in building our platform. What we, um, and, and that's, that, is, that platform has been built up over the last six years. It continues to be invested in, but, um, but that's what the common share equity is used for. We seek the capital that we put into these deals through limited partnerships um, or through other lender finance arrangements. And so you will have seen on our balance sheet in the last couple of years, we've done a warehouse deal where we've put a warehouse debt facility in place that has helped us fund some loans. We have three, two, sorry, two limited partnerships in place that uh, have funded investments. Um, those groups of limited partners who provide that capital, they're interested in yield return. They're not interested in capital gains for that particular basket of their money. And uh, providing them with access to the information on the asset pool is something that is just not done in private credit very well. And so they're very, very happy when we're able to provide that transparency into the basket of assets that they hold. Um, and that is a big sales point for us. Uh, we also are able to provide clarity on cash flows. So cash flows, how much you're going to be get paid for interest this month and how much you're going to get paid for interest next month and when these loans are expected to mature and when you're expected to receive your, your principal back. So that has made fundraising much easier for us over the last um, basket of years and um, certainly is something that you know, we lean on our tech platform heavily to be able to provide to them. So they roughly get a monthly statement or letter from you guys saying, hey, here are the, the loans you're a part of, and this these ones are delinquent, or these ones are, they're all paying on time, and, and they, these are, how, and because I guess they're not, like, especially on the revenue lending side, that's not a fixed amount. There may be a minimum fixed account amount, if I remember correctly, but if they're growing revenues gangbusters, you're going to get greater revenues off of that, Right. Yeah, they so quarterly reporting, um, and you know we we collect information monthly um, from the underlying uh, asset pool, make our decisions based on it. But then we aggregate that information up and report it quarterly to the investors, um, and we are able to show them how the pool is doing, what what whether the companies are growing or not. Um, the model that we have underlying is mainly fixed payments from the underlying companies, so it's it's pretty fixed term and fixed amounts, there are some step ups in payments. And so we're able to model that out for the investors and show them how their payments are growing over time. Okay. And you just said you don't use shareholder equity to lend. Uh, but I am seeing like, um, on your assets, you've got loans receivable 25 million current of that is 9 million. Is it just you're saying it's offset with debt on your balance sheet? And we have some or yeah, how, well, how, how, how do, do those assets sort of sit on your balance sheet? Uh, we have preferred, we have preferred equity. So there's a large preferred equity line, which has been um, funding uh, any loans that are on our balance sheet are funded through the preferred equity offering that was done. Um, we initially used debt to do that on our balance sheet, but we've cleaned almost all of that up off of our balance sheet and replaced it with preferred equity. Okay. So okay. if you need to raise, if you want to lend more directly, not through your LPs or, or partners, you need to raise more uh, preferred equity 
uh, and then in and that just goes to the funding. Yeah, and it is very clearly not our intention to do more on balance sheet lending. Our goal is to move as much as possible into limited partnerships on a go forward basis. Okay, thanks. So moving on, uh, the two companies, I think I've explained both of them. One is a software lending company. One is an asset backed lending company, different markets, but both have very specific niches where they are um, leaders uh, focused on that, those particular markets. We certainly look to uh, for any kind of collaborative opportunities between the two where a deal might come into one and we'll send it over to the other side because it's more appropriate for that side. For example, we share a technology platform, we share back office and we've achieved some scale. And I think um, we'll, we'll talk through what Pivot is, but then we'll talk through what the scale is. So Pivot specifically um, is mostly asset-based lending. It's uh, just about $100 million of assets under management. We did acquire this company on September 21st in exchange for some common shares and some preferred shares. Um, they lend directly off their own balance sheet, but they also are a sub-advisor to a fund called the Salernus Pivot Private Credit Fund. Um, they provide some lender finance to other lenders and they do a little bit of accounts receivable factoring purchase order. You can see that gray sliver is relatively small. The bulk of the company is um, direct lending into small and medium enterprises and lending into other uh, specialty niche uh, finance vehicles. So let's talk about how that has grown. Now, this slide is an aggregation of the assets under management. So AUM stands for assets under management. When you're um, sorry, when you're talking assets under management, that doesn't mean assets. That's what you're managed, not on your balance sheet. So if you're managing fifty million dollars for some in, uh, um, um, a pension fund, theoretically, that's that's under the AUM, but not on your balance sheet. So the dark blue section uh, and the light blue section are both on our balance sheet. Although when, when I say on our balance sheet, I mean, they're in the limited partnerships that we control and are thus consolidated onto our uh, public market um, company balance sheet. So the consolidated financial statements would include the dark blue and the light blue asset center management. The green is assets under administration, and that is the off-balance sheet uh, sub-advisor relationship with Salernus Pivot. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. So when yeah. It, if you run and start a new LP, it does show up, but it shows up under your um, like, uh, or non-controlling interest. Um, yeah. So we, when we are the GP, if my capital is the GP of a new limited partnership, we have to consolidate that in accordance with accounting rules uh, because we are the GP. However, it is a shows up as a non-controlling interest and not as an equity or, uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you. So if we were, now we, we acquired the company Pivot on September 21st, 2021. Um, and so if we were to hold those two companies together prior to that, which of course they were not together. So there's an asterisk on this chart. It is a pro forma chart looking backwards. Um, you can see that our assets, our asset growth has been very steep from 2018, 2019, 2020, 2021. And um, Martin, you made the comment earlier about 60 years over, you know, 10 to six deals over 10 years or six years, 10 per year. It absolutely has been accelerating. Um, in our first couple of years, we did two deals or three deals. And so the back end, the bulk of our deals have been on the back end of that period as the Tamaya machine has organically accelerated. But on top of that, the pivot machine has accelerated quite significantly over that period as well. And so you can see that from um, 2018, at the end of 2018, the combined entities put together had on the order of about 35, $37 million of assets under management, assets under administration. September 30th of 2021, we're upwards of $150 million of assets under administration. And that is quite significant growth over really a three and a half, three, three point seven five year period. Um, now, why does assets under management or assets under administration matter? The reason it matters is because that's what drives revenue, which is what drives profit for shareholders. 
So when you move on to the next chart, we, we talk through, um, again, a pro forma version of these two companies put together showing what our revenue would have been in each of these years. And you can see 2018, 5.5 million, 2019, you can see 7.3 million, 2020, we're over 10 into the $11.2 million of revenue. And for nine months of 2021, we're over 9 point, we're 9.7 million bucks of revenue. And I can certainly expect that 2021 will have a full 12 month revenue number that will be higher than 2020 for sure. So how do you recognize revenues? Is it just as a percentage of like each deal you underwrite, you, you charge 10% interest and you clip one or two points off of that? Or, um, and then there's an administration fee or how, how does your revenues roughly get calculated or, or worked out? So what's in, so so revenue in this case so it's, it's a bunch of different ways depending on which pool it is so it is a bit complicated but for pools that we control on our balance sheet or through a limited partnership where we control the full revenue is is recognized and so in that particular case if a loan is say paying 16% interest we will recognize 16% times the assets under management uh, for that basket there is a cost associated with that, which would be how, where did the capital come to fund that loan? And in our case of our balance sheet, that would, a lot of that would go to the non-controlling interest as the providers. But what's important for the common shareholders is that on the Tamaya capital side of the fence, we keep about 6% of the assets under management for the common shareholders. So if we have $100 million of loans under management, we should be keeping about $6 million of that as what I would consider to be gross margin on the income statement. And that is what we use to fund the operational expenses and it's what we use to provide profit to shareholders. So as we grow that assets under management, that 6% is what flows down to the bottom line. And then that's not 6% per quarter per period, that's sort of over the life of a, a loan. If you lend out a no, million per, dollars, you'll get 60 no, grand that, of that. That's will... per, per annum, per, per annum. annum. Yeah, so if we write a three year, it's important to understand this because this is a really, really key part of our business and the profitability of our business. If we write, like just for, um, if let's just for one loan, $100 million, which of course is nonsensical, but $100 million loan, $100 million loan, three years, um, six we keep 6% of that loan for three years. So that's $6 million in year one. And then year two comes along, we don't do anything other than just manage that loan. That's another $6 million. And then in year three, now all we're doing is continuing to collect data and manage that loan. That's a third $6 million. So it's actually like $18 million of profit off of that loan coming to, to my capital over that three-year period um, as profitability of that particular facility. If you're getting 6%, what portion of, like how much interest is the your, your client uh, the borrower paying you is that are you getting like they paying 18 percent and you're kind of getting a third of it or yeah that's about right it's about one third of it okay. so the and one important part to understand about our return our return is really made up of two pieces uh, one piece is the base interest on the facility so that might be 15 percent that might be 16 percent that's what the entrepreneur pays or the company pays to us. Um, the second piece of the loan are exit provisions, where an entrepreneur, after two and a half, they write a, we write a four-year facility, which is common with us to write a four-year facility. Um, the entrepreneur sells the business for a good number. After two and a half years, they pay us out. We are uh, entitled under the terms of the loan contract to a bonus. Um, for early buyouts. And so that will often add a couple more points of profitability onto that loan uh, in exchange for effect, you know, paying it out and, and terminating that loan early. So our total returns to investors, sorry, our total returns from underlying companies to us as a combination of those two pieces is north of 20%. And that gets split roughly two thirds to the yield investors and one third to us. You have, besides that early payment penalty or bonus for you guys, um, or do you have any warrants or let's say they get bought out by Facebook for a billion dollars? Do you, do you have any juice on that side of it? You know, we, that's, that's an, the answer is no. And the reason I say that with some uh, 
emphasis is we spent the first two years of this business playing around with warrants and very quickly came to the realization that warrants uh, not only are not worth a lot, they're actually detrimental to our sales process. And here's why. The basket of companies that we're lending to are not the kinds of companies that Facebook's going to buy for $500 million. They are the kinds of companies that will get sold for $25 million, $50 million, or $75 million. And so the value of the warrants in that process, when you're investing it, when they're already at, say, $3 million of revenue, and they're going to sell at $20 million of revenue, the value of those warrants does not uh, add up to enough to overcome the friction that is created in the negotiation process when we're closing those loans. So we structure our loans more around uh, the cash payments uh, when they exit the loan as our, as our bump. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. It's interesting. It, it was, it took us a couple of years to kind of get to that conclusion because we came from venture capital as private equity guys, yeah. uh, where warrants were a very big part of what we did. But um, at the end of the day, it just wasn't worth it. So growing revenue as we move through the years, you can see we're continuing to grow. It is tied to the assets under management as the assets under management grow, um, the revenue grows. And, and as, and I, Certainly, I'm comfortable saying that the operational expenses that we incur are not growing anywhere near as fast as the revenue is growing. And as such, we have moved uh, through break even and into profitability and continued, look to continue to grow the profitability of our particular of our company over time. The only the only volatility that would happen in revenue in our business, there's two kinds. Upward revenue, upward volatility would be when we have an exit from a loan that involves a gain of, say, a million dollars, which has happened multiple times. So we would have to record that gain in one quarter, but that would be upward volatility. The negative volatility that's possible is uh, writing off a loan. We've never had to write off a loan, but if we ever did have to write off a loan, that would be the negative volatility that occurs. What's the worst case scenario that, or substance that's happened, let's say on an asset loan, or have you had to seize assets or have you been able to, everyone been able to sort of arm wrestle and sort of scrimp and save and, and, and pay their way out of their, their loans? So on the Tamaya Capital side of the fence, the technology lending side, um, we have in all circumstances been able to negotiate the exit from a business via sale. And it is a complicated for companies that are underperforming. And we do have companies in the portfolio that underperform, of course. Um, we are able to work because we're getting data from the underlying company every single month and we're able to see where the company is tracking. We get into early conversations with management and with the shareholders and the board and start to put together a plan as to what's going to happen six months down the line, three months down the line, you know, when the cash starts to get low. And that conversation is a difficult one. It all often involves us asking the equity investors if they're prepared to put more money into these companies or not. And if the answer is not really, then we say, well, you know, a good sales process takes at least three months, often six. Let's start planning for a sales process so that we can get our money back and you're going to get your money back. And that has worked out in every circumstance that we've had. So we've been able to move those companies onto the market. No doubt we've benefited from um, a solid M&A market on the software or the tech side. Um, but if a company were uh, struggling and there were not solid M&A activity on the technology side, keep in mind, um, these companies have 75 or 80% gross margins. And the reason they're losing money is simply because they're hiring more salespeople. And laying off salespeople or other operational people is actually quite easy in these businesses. And thus, at a certain point, $2 million of revenue, $3 million of revenue, these companies can very easily get themselves to break even and just tread water for long enough to get through any sort of market down cycle. So that's the technology side of the fence. On the asset-backed small and medium loan sides of the fence, that, that is, of course, a more complicated uh, situation. There certainly have been companies that we have had, um, you know, to work out and to get our money back on. But those loans are asset backed. They either have guarantees. Uh, they have uh, from the individual and from the people behind the companies. Um, there's hard assets inside those companies, and so that's more of a traditional workout process. 
And really the important question there is, you know, do you have solid asset backing coverage on the, comp on the companies you're investing in? And the answer is yes, we do. On the revenue, on the Tamaya side of it, um, where do you stand on the cap table? Like how, like, are you like at the top of the cap table get paid out first? Or are there sometimes other loans ahead of you, the mortgage or I, I, whatever other debt facilities they may have? So on the smaller companies, and I define smaller companies as $1 million of revenue to three or $4 million of revenue, we will, in almost every circumstance, be top, uh, top debt. And that means basically first to get paid. Um, once we get into larger companies, so four, five, six, seven million dollar revenue companies, there will often be a bank, in particularly in the United States, you'll see a bank in there where they are comfortable lending a smallish amount, certainly less than we're comfortable lending. And so we will come in as a secondary facility subordinated to that senior facility, putting in the, the rest of the amount that we would have been comfortable lending. And so we will be a subordinated facility, second on the ladder with an intercreditor agreement with a senior lender on those larger companies. But on the smaller companies, we're generally speaking top of the ladder. Great, thanks. Okay. Uh, so the team, the team, um, you know, we are, Andrew and myself, uh, go back to the beginning of this business. You can see we're both chartered accountants, CFAs, uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers. Uh, we both come from the venture capital space where we were investing equity dollars in technology companies uh, for decades. Um, Ken and Dan came to us from Pivot. Um, Dan is the, uh, I call him the crusty debt guy. He is the guy who makes these hard credit decisioning system uh, decisions. He's the guy who um, knows what assets he should be locking up and should be, you know, evaluating companies on. Ken is the entre entrepreneur that started Pivot and built it up to what it is today. He, he has um, a long experience in TSX listed companies and in, in private credit and private equity. And then we have Brooke and Rob. Rob came to us from uh, Espresso Capital, one of our uh, former competitors, I guess, not so much now, but he has, uh, he has a decade in technology lending uh, across the country. And Brooke also came to us from PricewaterhouseCoopers, um, also a chartered accountant and, and holds down all of the back office as well as the portfolio management side of the fence. So capital structure, about 60 million shares outstanding. $25 million market cap. Uh, we also have 10.5 million preferred A shares outstanding. We have a few warrants, not many. We do have options outstanding. Those are all employee focused options, employee and board focused options. The insider ownership is large. Um, Ken, Andrew, myself, to a lesser extent, Dan, all own millions of shares. Um, the board, uh, are big investors in the common shares. They're big investors in the preferred shares, and they're also big investors in the limited partnerships. Um, we have had an NCIB announced and underway since March 1st, 2021, although it has not been very active lately um, as we work through the integration issues associated with getting these two companies together and as we move towards releasing our consolidated results uh, through audit. It'll, it'll be a little quieter on that front. So deep industry experience in specialty lending for both SaaS and small, medium businesses. We have a pr proprietary technology, which allows us to do things better and faster in what has traditionally been a very opaque private credit industry. Um, we're scaled up now. It has been uh, uh, a long time to grow to where we are now, but growth is expanding and accelerating. And while well, accelerating growth and the number of deals we're originating and the revenue growth are accelerating by year, as you can see from what I showed you. So we look forward to all of that adding up to increased and increasing profitability um, every year, every quarter going forward. Um, um, <clears throat> like we've had really hot um, venture spec markets since kind of COVID started. Uh, although I guess liquidity from the, the Fed going into it seems to be a correction. Who knows where what's going to happen over the next six months? But is that a correction 
or a, a def, uh, deflating of those markets? Does that create opportunities for you or like higher interest rates? Are you able to tick up your, mar your, your rates charged? Uh, talk about sort of that macro backdrop and how it affects you. Yeah, we like... So, so there's there's a pro and a con on 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 the spec stuff. So, um, the the pro uh, the the con on the spec stuff is that we don't see maybe as many companies getting exited out of our portfolio. Uh, we've had companies that have been bought out or entered into transactions on that front that have resulted in gains for us. At the same time, I'm not you know I'm not. Um, uh, I'm not super excited or happy to see every company in our portfolio get exited because that means I have to go find another loan to replace it. So, so there's on the con, there's, there's kind of mixed feelings on the, on the spec side, but um, when the economy takes a downtick, generally speaking, that's when funds like us excel because companies need capital and more companies need capital. And we're able to go and look through all of these companies and decide which of these companies, the now bigger pool of companies is the, are the ones that we wanna back. And we're really comfortable with the metrics that we've developed over the last six years and the history we have to be able to decide which of those companies we want to bet on and which ones are good bets. So, you know, a downtick in the economy leads to increased demand for our product and increased demand for our product allows us to choose better companies coming out of it. So that's the downtick side on that. To speak to the interest rate issue, we've, you know, we've had just had historically low interest rates for so long. Um, and our, you know, our pricing is in that 15 to 17 range, 14 to 17 range. Um, as interest rates move up, there would be some room for us to be able to move up our interest rates, but um, you know, not, not a ton. So I certainly monitor in underlying interest rates. If interest rates, base interest rates or risk-free interest rates were to go up by two or three points, I don't think there would be any issues. But if we were to go back to the, you know, the bad old days of the early 80s where interest rates were, fifth, base interest rates were 15%, you know, I think that there would be, you know, some upper end limit to what we were able to charge in the marketplace. Right. I'm curious, when you were originating loans and underwriting them during like sort of worst COVID times, were, did, could you do or can you still do it all virtually or does someone have to get on a plane and go somewhere or like, like how, that, that due diligence process, it, it, how has that been affected? Yeah, it's, it's always been all virtual. Uh, we use a lot of tools. So we use, we use some advanced uh, background checking software for individuals. We use um, um, advanced um, company background checking tools to look for anything. We use some social, social tools to look for fraud. So, I mean, there's a bunch of different tools that we use to, to do what we do without ever having to fly there. Again, just to, you know, talk through both, this is true for the referral agent side, but also for other costs on a deal. If, again, if we're gonna do a million dollar deal, um, no, let's say it's a $500,000 deal and our spread, our, our gross margin is 6%. Um, you know, you're looking at thirty thousand dollars of profit a year. You're going to fly on a plane somewhere. That's five five thousand bucks to fly and stay and fly back, and all the time and costs associated with that. That's a good chunk of your profitability. So you need to be able to do these small loans effectively and efficiently without ever having to, um, you know, get on planes and do and fly places. That's why the, nobody's doing these loans. But the tools are there. Like the tools that we use. Um, give me assurance in these underlying companies in a, in a way that um, no plane visit has ever been able to. So we are able to dig into the backgrounds of these companies and these people's, the people involved in ways that, um, you know, I didn't, I just don't think were possible 10 years ago. And I guess, especially on the software side, um, 
like these are now virtual organizations where there may not even be a head office or a tiny one. And then the whole team is spread out. Like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you, well, like a site visit. What the heck does that mean? That the, the servers are in AWS, the CFO is on the West Coast, the CEO is on the East Coast. So, well, so and the dev team is in Hungary. Um, yeah. So there's a lot of, there are, there are decisions that we make through that whole process about how comfortable we are uh, with certain aspects of that spread. And we will walk away from loans that we feel are too spread. Um, because at the end of the day, if a company refuses to pay us back, we have to be able to collect our money. And so there are jurisdictional issues, there are team-based spread issues. So that's part of our decision-making process that is a bit proprietary is when we dig in, we're looking at those kinds of things and making some hard decisions about whether we want to do these companies or not. Again, the aim is to deliver a large pool of deals and then to select the ones we like the best. So that's a big part of what we do. I'm not a debt guy. I'm always on the equity side. So whenever I talk to debt guys and, and that, I'm always like, what am I meant? Like, I don't know what I don't know. Um, and whatever, you're biased, but have I missed, have we sort of hit the key points of kind of the drivers, the elements here? Or is there something where kind of uh, something we missed? Um, I think, you know, the one point I think is important that is maybe buried underneath the surface is that profitability element that you asked about earlier, where we talked about the profitability of these loans. It's not just one year's worth of profitability. Like originating a loan is like, you know, the gift that keeps giving for three or four years or five years, depending on the term of the loan. So term of loans, average term of loans is a really important piece of understanding the profitability of us versus our competitors and, you know, understanding us profitability versus just other kinds of companies. I think the second thing is to talk about maybe go forward strategy a little bit. We really like we really like specialty niche lenders that understand their market very well and are able to deliver excess returns um, and are technology enabled. Um, and I think there's some opportunity going forward in this space as more, more of these kinds of companies are created and grow privately. I think there continues to be opportunity for us to look at uh, partnering or otherwise acquiring other specialty lenders uh, that maybe don't have the technology platform we have and then applying our technology platform to that company. So I think there's some exciting things in the future where we can continue to grow Tamaya not only organically for under each of the brands we have now, but maybe also looking at some more strategic actions in the future as well. What is the um, rate limiting factor for your growth? If I gave you a a hundred million dollars and said, go at it, Mike, like how long, like, is that what's slowing you down or do you have to hire twice as many people or spend twice as much on LinkedIn or just, you're kind of at the flow rate you're at and without adding on extra risk. Um, that's sort of, if you know what I'm getting at. I do. I spend every day. I think I deal with this. <laughs> um, I would, I would say over the past couple of years, the rate limiting step has been the acceptance of debt as an option for an entrepreneur that has $2 million of revenue and getting uh, selling the concept of debt into that marketplace and putting it up, holding it up against venture capital or angel financing as a better option. And then getting that understood across you know, the entrepreneurial community has been the rate limiting step. And so if you look through our LinkedIn page or our blog page, you're going to see all kinds of content about how, you know, keep more of your company is one of our taglines, for example. And, you know, here's why debt is better than equity. And there's all that work. And so that has been the rate limiting step is really not only are we, you know, building a machine and a platform, but we're out there evangelizing about why debt is better for an entrepreneur you know, who, whose company has a certain profile. And that's a big part of what we've been able to do. And I really, you know, we're seeing increased outreach, we're seeing increased success, we're seeing increased origination leads are coming our way. So we're really seeing the needle start to move on, on that front, but that has been the rate limiting step. 
All right. And so news flow wise over the next three or six or for the rest of uh, 2022, um, uh, your, your news flow is a little on the boring side. You, you announce your dividends, which is, uh, I guess, to be expected now that it, it started. You've got your quarterly results. Do you announce sort of big lending deals or is it more just be limited to strategic stuff and uh, M&A if you find a, a new specialty lender to uh, acquire? So we are announcing, first of all, the next, I think the next really interesting piece of news that, uh, uh, well, not, not the next, but the most interesting piece of news that, that should be followed is when we announce our financial report um, of the consolidated entity. This will be the first um, full quarter of consolidated results and really will be transformational from what we've been announcing in the past because it's a much larger organization with much bigger numbers. Um, so that's the first piece that I think people should really be focusing on. The second thing we're doing is we are announcing quarterly uh, information on how many deals we've done, the dollar value of the deals we're done. We call it the corporate update, but people, uh, investors should be following that to see you know, what has the company done? That comes out uh, just shortly after the end of the quarter. And as such, you know, is relatively quick information and a relatively quick guide on how that previous quarter has gone in terms of our ability to be able to put money to work, the kinds of exits we've seen. Um, individual deals don't tend to be material anymore, given the size of our organization, maybe as like maybe as they were five, three or four years ago. So we don't tend to announce individual deals unless it were truly a large deal and it were, you know, approaching materiality. So really, it for us, it's about uh, financial results. It's about the corporate update, which is a summary of the total amount of deals done, um, and and then any sort of special transactions that come up. All right. Um, that's good. I, I'm kind of out of questions. I'm not seeing any more uh, questions. Oh, wait, we do have a question here. Um, as your revenues have grown, the earnings and assets attributable to the common shareholders haven't gone up. Do you see this changing? Is, is that a factual? Is that true? Or um... So the, the revenues and the profits have gone up. Um, the NCI profit has gone up dramatically. The profit associated for common shareholders has improved, but has not improved to the same amount or quantity as what has been seen on the NCI side. The answer is yes, we do see an acceleration in the profitability for common shareholders coming, coming our way. One of the headwinds we've had has been um, foreign exchange. So We've had some foreign exchange headwinds that have been working against us on the common shareholder side in the last little while. And that has, in fact, worked against us a little bit in terms of hiding the actual improvement we have been showing on the common shareholder side. And uh, that brings up a good point. How I, I'm presuming, what is the ratio between, I presume you're only North America, and is it, what's the Canada-US balance in that in your business? And, and everything in the US is obviously done in US dollars, so you've got a fair amount of FX uh, risk associated with that. Yeah, so on the Tamaya side, it's about 70 US, 30% Canada, uh, in terms of new deal origination and dollars put to work. Um, on the pivot side, it's 100% Canada. So between those two, when you meld those two together, uh, we're approximately 60 Canada, 40 US now at this point. Okay. And on the pivot side, is there, do they any expansion plans into the, the US or are they just whatever their technology, their, their workings are kind of Canada focused? So it's also got to do with the legal system and the ability to yeah. execute on loan agreements, for example. Canada is better for that, for that company. And as such, their fruit, their meat of growth is really going to be in Canada for the next little while. I, I don't see them going into the States. And um, in the States, it's very much like there's a much greater state difference amongst the States than there is a provincial difference in Canada. Am, am I right on that? Yeah, 100%. So even if you said I was going to go to the states in that business, you would actually only go to like, say, 10 states, 
you would go to 10 specific states and do deals in those states as opposed to say, you know, other states like uh, maybe a Texas, for example, where it's a little more difficult to execute on your on your loan um, security. I, sorry, I just, I was making, the Enron guys from 20 years ago, they bought these massive houses because you couldn't uh, go after a person's house in Texas. Yeah, so that's it's, it's, it, it is truly amazing how much difference there is between say, you know, a Connecticut or um, even New York and a Texas or a Georgia or any of those. It, it is just, you have to be, I don't know how they do business down there, to be honest with you. It's for that particular business, there's so many, there's so much difference between states. You have to really be on top of it. All right. Well, not to get too sidetracked on that. Um, Mike, uh, we're in an hour into this. Uh, I found it very interesting. And I, I think I learned a whole lot about lending and your business model and, and, and so forth. So thank you very much for taking the time to chat with us. That was interesting and uh, excellent. Martin, thank you for that, for the uh, time and for the questions. And thank you to everybody that uh, listened through the whole presentation. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Cheers. Take care.